Mini episode 1050 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode number 1050. This is FDH managing partner Rick Morris here. We are welcoming back to the show a gentleman that we've had on previously, and uh, last time around we were talking to him uh, about uh, essentially his day job at that point in time with uh, kfabecommentaries.com. You can find uh, him on Twitter, at kfabeshawn. Of course, we are speaking of Sean Oliver. You can also find his works at seanoliverbooks.com. But in alluding to something being separate from his day job, a side project that he has here now with his second book out about uh, the world of pro wrestling. And this is a fascinating offshoot of it, Father's Blood. I really enjoyed getting to read the advanced copy. I want to thank him for forwarding it. Uh, a tremendous read about uh, the, the subculture, as it were, of families of pro wrestlers and uh, what the children go through, what the wrestlers go through with their life on the road. And I think it it verges even into wrestling executives, essentially anybody connected with the pro wrestling world, what it's like for them having kids. Not often great and not often great for the kids. Uh, That shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. But uh, the, the stories themselves are tremendous, Sean. A great book. Welcome back to the show. How are you today, sir? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me back on. Glad you enjoyed it. I really Journey did. inside the wrestling family. A fascinating concept, the wrestling <laughs> family, right? Exactly. I, I, always, I would sit with these guys doing the interviews for Kayfabe, right? And, mm-hmm. and the topic of family would sometimes come up with select wrestlers, right? Especially second generation guys. I always loved to hear about their perspective as a kid uh, growing up, usually in the Kayfabe era, right? So, like, how deeply did that extend? You know, was mom being Kayfabe too, or is she speaking Carney, you know? Um, but then also, just in general, um, how they handled their children then, uh, by, I guess, by the 80s, and that's kind of where a lot of the guys profiled in the book were having their kids. Um, the cat was kind of out of the bag, right? I mean, when, I, I don't know, in 89, 90, 91, especially when we had, you know, hockey players and garbage men in the ring, and <laughs> were we really even suspending disbelief at that time? Or right. Did it become laughable? Um, but going back further, it was very interesting for me to hear how, like, let's say Gary Hart handled Jason and Chad, his kids, um, turn of the 80s, you know, like 79, 80, 81, right there, where nobody was uttering the term sports entertainment anymore. Right. It, it was it was sport. You know, we'd go into a locker room with Abby and Brody and <laughs> tell them it's sports entertainment. Right. Like in so, you know, those guys, it was really interesting to hear how guys like uh, Gary Hart handled it. Kevin Sullivan, of course, who had kids uh, throughout the 70s and early 80s. Uh, then much later in, in life, uh, had children while he was um, on the creative team in WCW. So there's kind of two eras that Kevin can speak to um, when they were playing it straight, so to speak, and then when, you know, when dirt sheets and websites were talking about quarter hour ratings and whatnot. Sure. And that's, it's a thing where, you know, it, it's, it's a real great pleasure to get to talk about something like this on the show, because again, the show where nothing is off topic, we do spend a, a decent amount of time on uh, pro wrestling. For, for nothing being off topic, I think if, if you look at our list there, pro wrestling probably slots in at about number three as far as the amount of time that we've uh, spent on it. So we, we spend a fair amount of time on the sport of Kings, but this is what's outstanding is that you get to talk about it in a way separate than, say, reviewing the horror that was WrestleMania 9 or something like that. We're, we're taking a look at sort of the sociology of it, and you, you tell that story early on in the book about where it just sort of hits you like a lightning bolt and, and where it, it felt that you were sort of grappling with your own thoughts of like, oh, gee, is this kind of exploitative as you're sitting there and yeah. Sean Waltman is pouring his heart out 
about that. And that's a thing where, is it fair to say that that thing, and when you, when you examine it later, because you go through your thought process and everything, is that something that really seriously kind, kind of laid some of the seeds for this book? Um, it wasn't until, well, let me go back. Anytime I speak about a topic that is uh, intently interesting to me, part of what we do at KFA Commentary is we cover the history, but then another part of it is dealing with the personalities, right? So a show like You Shoot, or particularly a show like Breaking KFA, where it's just me and the guest uh, talking about their lives. Uh, those moments shine in my memory of, of covering talent and history being able to talk to these guys uh, or ladies as people. So that was a very human moment when Sean Waltman, uh, for anyone that hasn't read Father's Blood yet, uh, I opened the book with an introduction uh, to when I, in discussing Sean's uh, drug use, I invoke the name of his children in questioning what legacy he's leaving for them. And he, it's on camera, it's, it's, it's it's out there. Uh, he breaks down on camera, and I realized immediately that, oh, my God, I just took this guy out of the knees by bringing up the kids. But at the same time, realized what compelling, real programming this is that you never see. I mean, never see in the wrestling genre. No, but nothing what this real is happening on the WWE Network. Uh, you know, the shoot industry is, you know, whatever that is, you know, how many human moments are happening on shoot DVDs with other companies. So I was so aware as a producer that this was great. But what a what a shortcoming of me as a person um, to be excited about this programming as another father is sitting across from a father telling me that his kids basically turned their back on him because of his abuse. So I kind of opened the book there because I wanted people to know that um, I take this seriously and uh, it was a moment that I wasn't proud of but one that I was infinitely aware was very important, and that's the wrestlers and their kids. And a business that is extremely unfair to the children of the wrestler. Um, the, listen, the dad made the choice to kind of throw it all in and, and run away with the circus when you went on the road with a wrestling company in the 70s or early 80s, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the wife took the ring and went to the altar with a the wrestler. They for the most part, knew what they were in for. Um, the kid had no say on the fact that dad was on the road 250 dates a year and maybe was doing things on television that were heinous that they'd have to explain at school. So I just wanted to get into that. I wanted to get into that first-hand accounts, talk to the people, talk to some children of wrestlers that are no longer with us, like Bam Bam Bigelow's son Shane and Gary Hart's son Jason, and hear their perspective, hear the, the workers' perspective, too, and how everybody dealt with this. So the Waltman thing was not the impetus for the book. Okay. The bo Actually, the book, I, I, was, I was in the theater watching Hamilton mm -hmm. yeah, on Broadway, and um, in the storyline between Alexander Hamilton and his son, who ultimately dies in a duel, taking the advice of, of, of Alexander. And Spoiler Hamilton, alert! Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, God, hey, oh, God, the, the damn thing's out. It's so well known by this point. Right. But, um, but in watching that, that's literally where the idea for the fathers and children of wrestlers came to me. I, I been, I, another wrestling book was due. You know, K-Fape had been out a few months. Uh -huh. and, uh, I, just, I didn't know where I was going to go. It was going to be a business book. People had written me on Twitter and said, you know, do a business book about how you build K-Fape. So I could have gone there. Um, I started another book, which will hopefully see the light of day. Uh, um, you ever hear the book, Everything I, I Learned, I've Learned from... Uh, in kindergarten, I think it's called everything uh -huh. I've ever learned, learned in kindergarten. Yeah, well, I started uh, two plus two equals K fit. Everything <laughs> I ever learned, I learned from wrestling. Because <laughs> all the great life lessons uh, happened on TV in 1982 on the grainy Channel 9 WWR TV here in New York. <laughs> so that's actually where the birth of the idea was, truth be told. Well, I'll tell you what, it's an interesting thing here, and I, I guess I'm going to get the kind of a depressing strain when I say this, but. When I read that part in there, and your thoughts specifically on what it was with 
Sean Waltman and what it was like in that moment there. It just it, one of the weird things about being a wrestling fan or anybody who's even tangentially involved in the business. You're very much involved in the business. We've interviewed about 15 to 20 wrestlers over the course of time, but I wouldn't consider that really being in the business. I mean, I'm just more of a fan. But even if you're a fan, this is an ugly word, you're complicit. Because I remember in the late 90s and in the 2000s, and everybody's dropping dead. And I remember we had Brian Alvarez on the show not long after Lance Cade passed away. And it's just like, you just, sometimes as a wrestling fan, you just want to take a bath. You know, it's just it, like, thankfully they're not dropping dead as much as they were, but some of them still are. Uh, I guess it's a lot of you know, a lot of times it's ones that are a little bit further out of the mainstream at this point. They've been out of the limelight further sometimes when they're passing away, like Balls and uh, some of the other guys in recent years uh, as well, Axel Rotten. But uh, it, it's just it's it's an ugliness that you feel sometimes, and a sense of being ashamed. And uh, we all kind of deal with it, right? We all stay fans. We all stay connected. Whatever, but. I don't know that people who are fans of other genres necessarily have to deal with something like that as much. The sense that things go wrong and you realize that with your dollars as, as an entertainer, or what you're paying for with the entertainment, that you're enabling this. You're enabling an unhealthy lifestyle. And as you point out in the book, the lifestyle of these kids that's uh, uh, kind of ripped apart sometimes by dads being on the road. So. How much have you dealt with that, even beyond the Sean Waltman thing? Have there just been moments where you've just thought to yourself, geez, I, I'm, I'm involved in, in, in a business that deals with a lot of ugliness, or is that something you can't afford to dwell on if you're going to be doing your job? Well, you, you're human, right? So, so you go there. Um, you're talking about it from the perspective of the fan giving their dollar. Yes. We, we, we get a, a, a much more direct accusation, unfairly, um, sometimes when people say, uh oh, oh. Yeah, so and so talking about his drug habit and kayfabe, giving them money, keeping them addicted. I, I, we're keeping people alive by mm -hmm. giving them a livelihood. Right. Um, I've never put anything into anyone's hand that was illegal. Right. Uh, I put money into people's hands to come on and and be a participant in a form of entertainment. Right. Uh, to tell their entertaining stories, to talk about history. Um, their contribution to wrestling history, have some fun on a show like You Shoot, or maybe talk about their personal lives on Breaking Kayfabe. I don't think we've done anything exploitative, and I don't really even know what the word means. Um, if I paid you to come on the air to talk about something for which you have some wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it is a battle with addiction, maybe it's something uh, just about your career, right? So am I, what am I doing directly? What I'm doing directly is employing you. Right. I've, I, 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 I do not tell you what to do with your money. I don't tell you what to do when you leave me. Um, most people, that I, 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 I don't want to lie, so I'm going to say 99% of the people we've worked with, I can say with certainty, just because I was the one sitting there looking into their eyes and probably was with them for five hours before the shoot, were totally clean and sober on the straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. Even so many of the ones that, that I see comments on YouTube like, oh my God, he's wasted. They were like the most sober moments that that person's ever had on shoot programming when they were with me. So I always kind of roll my eyes at it. Oh, geez. And, uh, and the other 1% are people that I have to say I have no idea because they walked in, uh, you know, 10 minutes before we rolled. So I don't know where they were, where they were, what they were doing. But, you know, we got content for the show. Uh, if you read my first book, Kayfabe, then you know there was a time where um, I had to turn the lights out on a wrestler and send them home. Right. Uh, because, uh, I, well, again, I can't say for certain what uh, Buff was doing that night. Maybe he was just real, real tired. Let's go with that. He okay. Was tired. Sure. Real tired. So much to the point, uh, so, so tired, rather, that uh, he could not even perform on camera. So it was nothing I could sell to anyone. It was nothing I would ever want anyone in that individual's family seeing, so we uh, we agreed to uh, to shut that down. Outside of that, th these guys are business people. For the most part, they know they got a job to do. They come in and they do it, and they have that performer's gene. They come in tired. Sometimes they come in uh, not very chatty, and you know what? When the light goes on, they know what's needed, and they deliver. Yeah, and they always do, and I, and I said before, I said when you were on the last time that, that I, I really admire. You're, you're very good at being able to get 
uh, everything out of them, being able to play off of them, uh, whether it be uh, being a straight man uh, for their humor or anything like that. I, I've always admired that from, from kayfabe commentaries. And in that spirit, I'd like to make an observation here that uh, in, in the part of your book when you were talking about uh, the housing in Florida there that uh, out of necessity Eddie Graham started putting uh, the heels living in one place and the faces living in another place. Uh, I can only think to myself, uh, a, a frequent guest that we've had on the program here over a period of time, a gentleman that I really like, Lex Luger, uh, boy, if he lived in the Florida territory of the 70s and had his career go the same way, Boy, would his kid have been ping-ponging between houses. Dad, we got to move again. Why do we have to move? That guy would have been back and forth between the heel and face apartments uh, five times a month. Yeah, that, that, that was really fascinating to me. That was when I was talking to Kevin Sullivan uh, for his his segment of Father's Blood. And he talked about how, I mean, Eddie Graham has spoken about it, common knowledge that he was one of the, one of the most fierce uh, enforcers of the no fraternizing between K, uh, the baby faces and heels uh, to the point where he, you know, he let Red Bastine go uh, right in the middle of his, right in the middle of their feud. Um, so there were, it, Tampa was booming in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, so there were housing complexes all over the place. And what started to happen as a de facto thing was like a baby face would get a place in a new development that's popping up, right? Mm -hmm. And he would tell you, like Steve Kern would say, you know, tell my grandma, hey, listen, you know, I got there's a new place here. So then he'd look into it. And so if that then got designated as a baby face complex, and not, and the heels knew that that one was off limits. So then another one would pop up, and you'd have Sullivan would get a place in one. So what started to happen is you had this de facto identity for each of the new condo developments in the Tampa area being designated as white hat or black hat <laughs> complexes. And the boys, and there, there weren't just two, like they would be spread out among seven, eight, ten complexes, a few guys in one, a few guys in another, depending on availability and price and if it's where they wanted to live or whatever. But there started to be uh, designations, good guy, bad guy designations for actual complexes for fear that Eddie Graham would ever even learn that a baby face had a comp had a, uh, a condo in a complex two floors and one building away <laughs> from somebody worked at the, the other side of the line. It was fascinating. That is amazing. I thought that was one of the great uh, parts of the book there. So that was something that was pretty funny. But then I, I, I used the word before sociology, and uh, maybe the most fascinating aspect of the book from that point of view was when you were talking about Balls Mahoney. And, and, and again, it's just it's, it's amazing how many... Uh, things from this book put me back to previous conversations we've had on the show. This was a conversation outside the world of sports, or outside of the world of wrestling and actual sports here with Jeremy Schaap when he was doing a thing on E60 uh, talking about the drug epidemic and what you were in, in sports, and you were talking about it with B Balls Mahoney and how he couldn't get his opiates anymore. And uh, I remember I asked Jeremy Schaap at the time because I said, look, I live in Ohio. We were the pill mill capital of the world right around the time of the, uh, the turn of the decade. And then they started yeah. cracking down on the pill mills, and now Ohio's got a heroin epidemic. And I asked him about Absolutely. that, if it was that way in sports, and he said that it was. He was finding that out as he investigated his story. And I'm seeing the exact same thing from what you're talking about in the book here with poor Balls Mahoney, is that, again, I, I've been a guy, the lesson I took from that is, again, pill mills are not a great thing, obviously, but they're quasi-regulated, it's quasi-within the system, it's not great that you're keeping people on these things, but... In terms of beating the alternative of going out onto the streets, maybe ending up with some fentanyl by mistake, you know, I'm seeing the exact same thing here, and it was just fascinating to see you bring that up in regards to Balls Mahoney and the lessons you took from it. Yeah, and it's happening all over. There's some documentaries on uh, either Netflix or Amazon, maybe, um, about some of these Midwestern uh, states and cities that uh, were, um, were pill mills. Mm -hmm. And by c clamping down, you know, it's kind of like a balloon, right? You, you, you're gonna, you want to squeeze one side of it, and uh, the padlock the uh, the prescription pads, as I said in the book. But then, what's going to happen? You know, the pressure slides to the other end, and then you're going to get street level drugs. It's it, nobody has ever kicked addiction, right? A true addiction. I'm not talking about some of you know weekend warriors. I'm talking about someone addicted with a daily habit, um, functioning because 
of their, their habit. I mean, part of society still, but on the fringe, heavily addicted. Nobody ever kicked that and went, you know what? Can't get these pills anymore, so I guess I'm just gonna I guess I'm just gonna kick this. They get out on the street. You, you crack down on street level drugs, right? We see this all the time, the war on drugs. Does anybody go, well, you know, it's a little harder to get my coke now. I guess I'll just stop. The way I described it was the level of desperation rises to meet the level of addiction. So they're just going to get it elsewhere. So I don't want to get too, too off topic, but, it, you know, it's the treatment of the person that we should be focused on. Um, the the, uh, the knee-jerk, uh, militaristic kind of uh, uh, clamping down on street level and... You still have the addicts. That's fine to take the dealers off the street. It's fine to get these guys who are writing bullshit scripts mm -hmm. taken care of. But you got to treat these people. You got to offer these people help. And I think, I think, there's a bit of, mo of a movement now in politics to do just that. Because how many decades of us not winning the freaking battle is it going to take before people go, okay, we got to win this uh, at the people level, at the person level, not at the dope level, not at spraying the fucking poppy field. Right. We got to treat these people and get them to a point where they've got another shot and they can choose to turn their back on that lifestyle. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I think you're right about that. I think when, when the heroin epidemic really seemed to spike in 2016, 2017, I think it really got people's attention in a way. And like I said, you know, living in Ohio... You know, we had it uh, the, the worst of a lot of places uh, with the pill mills, and then boom, with the heroin epidemic following thereafter. So yeah, to see you bring that up in the book was just something uh, that really caught my eye personally. But there was another thing that uh, I, I found very interesting in the book as well, uh, because I was flashing back to reading his book. Uh, Ole Anderson, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, made reference in his book to when he was a booker, pretty much... Uh, mandating that all the baby faces go out and bang uh, the ring rats, and uh, I'm sure Ole wasn't mandating that uh, his uh, baby faces were uh, single and unencumbered and whatever. So I, I always just thought that was like singularly scummy uh, in, in terms of that. And, and so in, in in the book here, when you're talking about wrestlers quoting, you know, that Ole doesn't give a crap about us or anything like that, that was something I could kind of see from Ole's own words, but. It, it's really an interesting kind of a thing, and Tito Santana talking about his experience of working for Oli, and it's a thing where, you know, very much so, we're used to in the wrestling business, there's like a short list on the one hand when you're talking about the greatest of all time, is it Ric Flair, is it for some people Hulk Hogan, whatever, uh, the, the list of greatest of all time is almost longer, I would say, than the list of known outstanding family men. You mentioned Tito of Santana in the book. I'd heard that about him before. Lance Storm is universally acclaimed, but it, it, that that is almost rarer than the unicorn, it seems like, and that's one of the depressing things about the wrestling business, that whether it be the influence of people like Ole Anderson, uh, the, the temptations of the road, whatever, these sterling five-star uh, family men are very, very rare to be found in the wrestling world. Yeah, that's true. That's specifically why I wanted Tito. By the way, um, as I was doing the as I was doing the book and sifting through, you know, the stories of these wrestling fathers and their kids and the family situations, and you know, we we touch on on substances a little bit, like you just mentioned, and you know, we touch on uh, Tony Atlas's story where uh, his daughter was the product of a uh, of a night of passion with uh, with a woman and his daughter was largely out of his life for, for most of, of his uh, most of uh, her life and then I, I needed success stories I needed the guys that just got it right and Tito's name always came up when I talked to people about who got it right who got it right everyone said Tito and um, and he did and his story was a road guy who got it right now Eric Bischoff's story is in there too and uh, Eric's very Eric's family is very tight to this day uh, but now he was doing it from the left, from the position of an executive right okay which is a little different than the guys that had a, that were you know on the road and in the cars and in the the, the motel sixes That's right. Eric traveled uh, Eric traveled a little differently he made a little bit different money um, later on when he was uh, you know in WCW and, and had uh, had a fair amount of pull right up through when he was uh, president of WCW wrestling. 
Um, but Tito was a road guy his whole life, um, and 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 a heavy road guy. I mean, this is a guy eighty four. He gets the Intercontinental Title, and so that right there, that's the B Show main event for a year and a half. Right. You know, so he's doing three hundred dates a year in any city that Hogan's not. So he was able to get it right. He and Lee, his wife, were able to get it right and make it work, raise three children um, through as heavy a road schedule as as anybody for, for an extended period of time. I mean, he went to WWE in 83, and he never left. Yeah, and that's uh, it's very interesting that you mentioned that in about 84, because one of the things that I flashed to in my mind is, I believe that was the year uh, he blew out his knee working the series against uh, Valentine, and uh, yeah. for, for any other wrestler, that would be, you would think, just about the worst thing in the world. Ah, I'm off the road. I'm not making my usual money, if any, uh, whatever. But uh, for a guy like Tito, there would at least be uh, the silver lining of getting to spend more time with his family. Yeah. But uh, he, that was that was the age where they they, they worked you like a racehorse. I remember him telling the story, if I recall correctly, on a, a series we had uh, for Kayfabe called uh, My Side of the Story, where... Uh, Tito talked about uh, the feud specifically with uh, with Valentine. The whole the whole episode covered the Valentine uh, Santana feud. Just for the sheer amount of days those two guys worked each other. And by the way, this was a time when you had two guys working each other for a year and a half. You know, several hundred days on TV, in on uh, house shows, um, on Saturday Night's Main Event, on all that, and they managed to keep it fresh. Fans stay passionate. Today, the guys work against each other several thousand times, also, but nothing seems to change. Right. Um, back then, they they could keep a crowd electrified over that amount of time. But anyway, Tino was talking about how he got the leg injury, but they hadn't shot anything to explain his coming absence. Mm-hmm. So, with the torn cartilage or the whatever the actual injury was, it was significant enough to need surgery. All that footage that WWE aired at the time in '84 of him getting surgery that was legit. Um, so they didn't they hadn't shot anything to get him off TV. And back then, you know, you, you couldn't just explain away someone's absence. They, fans had to see it. They right. had to put that because it would also plant the seed for a few you know, when he comes back. So he had to go out there with the torn apart knee and shoot that angle where Greg beats the shit out of his leg, <laughs> smashing it with the belt, wouldn't relinquish the figure four. I think they shot it in Canada, and he goes out there with this shredded kneecap um, just for the sake of being able to air something before he goes in for surgery and has to go off the road for a couple of months. He wasn't off the road very long, uh, as you were alluding to. That's right. That's right. Uh, you're, you're right about that. They, uh, I remember that they played up the long rehab, but yeah, I think it was it was not as long in uh, reality as, as uh, they were uh, acting like it was. I will say this too, I mean, and this is not much of a uh, consolation, I'm sure. If you're Tito Santana and you're going out there and you're having all that happen to you, it's not easy, or it's not it's not very hard to give the best sell job of all time if you're in that much legitimate agony. I mean, the look on his face yeah, didn't it. have to be worked. <laughs> He was the business's first method actor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to experience it, and it's going to come through, and uh, everything. And uh, again, Tito, yeah, God bless him. One of the guys who got it right. And like I said, it, it, I, I can only like name a couple off the top of my head. Uh, like I said, there's him. There's Lance Storm. I, I don't know of too many. Uh, I, I hear that. Uh, I guess Tommy Rich. I guess I've heard uh, good things about his family. But uh, just just the fact that you have to furrow your brow to think about this uh, really kind of yeah. tells you all you need to know about the, the business and uh, everything. And uh, again, I thought you did such a good job of uh, investigating it. And, and again, people could tell from our conversation here, really the good, the bad, and the ugly as far as that. I thought it was balanced as far as you found different examples uh, of, of, of things that wrestlers had to deal with. Some folks uh, passed their wrestling days like J.J. Dillon, uh, some, some front office folks like uh, Eric Bischoff, Gary Hart, uh, and, and everything that they were dealing with. So uh, I thought it was just a really, really excellent book. Of course, SeanOliverBooks.com. Uh, you can find more information about it there. You've always got a lot going on with KFabeCommentaries.com. Uh, anything uh, much that you have in mind for your next, whether it be outside project like this or uh, another p- potential series with Kayfabe Commentaries? What, what's next with Sean Oliver, in other words? Well, uh, I'm working on another fiction book, which uh, I hope to have out uh, in uh, early 2019. Um, I guess people are going to start
start asking me about the next wrestling book, aren't they? <laughs> so yes. I'm going to have to start thinking in terms of that. I did like, uh, of course, Kayfabe was my story. It was the company's story. I liked being able to do what I do with Kayfabe commentaries, and that's tell other people's stories. So I did enjoy that aspect of Father's Blood. Um, maybe I'll do something in that vein again. I wanted it to read like a piece of narrative fiction. I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be able to function as a work of fiction almost. If, if, if you were to read it, here's a collection of eight guys or so who throughout the 250 pages pop up here and there in each chapter, checking in where they are at this time in their life and, and, and into this time in their family story. So I wanted to tell it very much, um, like a narrative story, I, I encourage these guys to give me as as many specific stories. Uh, let me paint a scene for these people. I don't want to report it like investigative journalism. I didn't want to be, um, you know, uh, someone from the outside talking about J.J. Uh, uh, Dillon had difficulty with the birth of his uh, twins. Um, I want to go into the hospital room. I want to talk about it from... JJ's and Lindsay's perspective um, as one baby's born and the next baby's born completely lifeless and what happens in that room. Um, and so hopefully I was able to capture that emotion and tell the story very much in that vein. That was, that was certainly my goal. Well, yeah, as far as the roller coaster part of it, I want to talk about that a little bit as well because uh, as a writer myself, I, I'm always uh, very, very quick to put over whenever I see uh, a good method being used for something. And i got to say, once I started it and I'm reading and there, there's a blurb on the first wrestler and you leave off there and it cuts to the next one, and my thought was like, hmm, where's he going with this? And then like, I, I caught on very quickly. It's like, oh, he's going to keep interspersing these throughout the book. Like, I thought that was a, a very, very interesting method for you to use. I think people will find it very effective as they're reading it. Well, I, I hope so. You know, the, the, the instinct, of course, was to tell Tito's story start to finish chapter two, right. tell JJ's story start to finish chapter three. But instead of that, I, I would rather, I thought it would rather be, it would be more interesting for me to group it by the time in these fathers' lives. They all go through these five stages as a parent. Now, their experience within each that's the difference, yes. and that's what we can spend time with each of the guys on. But they all, you know, they all have their familial beginnings, meeting their wife and deciding to have children. There's all those early years as the working parent having to hand the newborn back to wifey and head out the door to do another 30 days before they come back in to see the child now, you know, 30 days old. Um, then they all go through those school years having to deal with the questions and issues and fights and stuff that go on with the kids, a child of a wrestler in school, and as a parent, how are they going to handle that? They're on the road all the time. How are they going to discipline? How about that story about the Gary Hart's problem? Gary Hart's promo of, as, as Gary Hart's wife is complaining, giving a laundry list to him over the phone when he's calling in from the road of all of Jason's misdeeds, and Gary says, I'll be home Wednesday. <laughs> Four words. <laughs> More effective than the thousand-word promos in his world-class days. I'll be home Wednesday. Well, and Jason yeah. <laughs> ruminated on those words for about five days. Well, that was a thing where, you know, his, his day job imbued him with a certain air as far as that goes. That, that guy knew how to give menacing interviews, whether he was threatening Dusty Rhodes or the Von Erichs. Yeah, I can only imagine if you're wanting to convey menace to your own son, he certainly had a lot of practice on the job. But it's a thing where uh, the, the, the one last thing I want to note to you, since you're talking about Gary Hart, I, I found this really interesting, is when you think about what goes into the fabric of a pro wrestling marriage and that particular aspect of uh, pro wrestling fatherhood, uh, the fact that, uh, again, I think you said that maybe his wife went to maybe one of the Texas Stadium shows or this or whatever, but it's a thing where there, there's a lot of times where wives don't take a great deal of interest in their husband's career, but that's generally if they're, you know, like an insurance executive that works out in an office park or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, this is Gary freaking Hart, who's out there in the, in the wild world of pro wrestling. Like, the, the fact that, and I don't say this to, I'm not slamming his wife in any way. I just found it fascinating that she just seems sort of indifferent to the day job because you wouldn't think that that's the kind of woman who's attracted to one of these guys. Yeah, that's true. It was, uh, I think she did one one Texas Stadium show and a Cotton Bowl show <laughs> uh, just because they were big houses. And that was it. And, uh, you know, she, she 
was friendly with a couple of the boys' wives um, in, in kind of a cursory way. She liked a couple of, like, liked Austin Idol as a as person. But, but yeah, was, you know, just had her home life. Dad's work was work. You know, Gary's work was work. And that was it. And, and in studying these families, that's the stuff I wanted to know. How did these homes work? And, and it was because, number one, the ones that worked were the ones who seemed to have had the most success. A couple of things were, were consistent, as, as you saw. Number one, they may not have been home a lot, but when they were home, they made it count. Now, this goes counter to, like, hearing Ric Flair on the 30 for 30 special on ESPN saying, oh, the married I was in the house. I wanted to get the hell back on the road. Well, <clears throat> these guys were the opposite. Gary Hart, even Bam Bam Bigelow, they all spent every second they could with the wife and, and particularly the children. Yeah, ex- so. exactly. That, that right there, that was one of the uh, the TMI moments of, out of Ric Flair's 30 for 30 uh, much like how he recounted when uh, the doctor asked him how often he flogged the dolphin, and he, and he said twice a day. And I'm thinking to myself, geez, no wonder he never knocked up any rats out on the road. That must account for it. <laughs> Guy didn't have anything left to, to shoot out uh, when, when he was going out at night. But, uh, you know, there were a couple things that were too much information from him. But uh, anything you are ever getting from any of your interview subjects, Sean Oliver, I dare say, is never too much information. And, uh, again, always enjoy checking out what you've got going on. And, again, Father's Blood, an excellent book. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Uh, as I knew it would be, as it was the last time, a great conversation with you, sir. Look forward to catching up with you subsequently uh, to talk about your, uh, your coming projects. Likewise. Thank you, and uh, thank you to all the folks for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, for everybody, for checking us out for FDH Lounge Mini Episode number 1050. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 